And God forbid, it's a horrible tragedy to be born without the ability to hear and speak. But that cannot cause us, lead us to be naive to the fact that Helen Keller was an occult leader. Here is Helen Keller's own book published by the Swedenborg Foundation. Why would the Swedenborg Foundation, an occult foundation, why would they publish her book, Light in My Darkness? Helen Keller says, Swedenborg teaches us that love makes us free. That's occult love. That's satanic love. We become masters. Notice, see, Satan, masters. The symbol of independence, the force, creators of good. We discover in ourselves many undeveloped resources of will and thought. That's a New Age statement. That's a, that is an occult statement. The God within, the force within. It goes back to the mystics throughout the centuries. Jacob Beam and others. Swedenborg. Who is this Swedenborg that she says teaches us? about this love that makes us free. Swedenborg, who died in 1772, declared that the second coming of Christ was the revelations he received to give to the world. Where did he get these so-called revelations? He professed that he was communicating with spirits from the planet Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, Saturn, Venus, and the moon, and beyond. He denied salvation through faith alone. John Wesley lived in his day and called him a madman, a society of lunatics, blasphemous nonsense, a filthy dreamer. He says, let these dreams sink into the pit from which they came. John Wesley writes about Swedenborg in one of his magazines and says, Swedenborg's hair stood upright and he foamed a little at the mouth. He said he was the Messiah. He then undressed himself and rolled in very deep mud. Helen Keller discovered Swedenborg at age 16. She goes on to say, Since I was 16 years old, I have been a strong believer in the doctrines of Emmanuel Swedenborg. Why should I change my faith? I have a pro profound respect for the teachings of Baha'u'llah. I am a Swedenborgian. The other man that she mentioned here is the founder of the Baha'i religion that's bringing all religions together in one occult New Age religion. So, Helen Keller was an occultist. That's why they call her a theosophist, which is really theosophy in modern times. It's really just the old Gnosticism. Uh, theosophy was founded by H.P. Blavatsky, who edited the magazine Lucifer, Lucifer Magazine. Notice what Blavatsky says in her Theosophical Glossary. Of all mystics, Swedenborg has certainly influenced theosophy the most. So, here is Helen Keller embracing this man, this devil-possessed man, who the theosophists who follow Lucifer believe is the greatest of all occult mystics. She says his clairvoyant powers, however, were very remarkable. And she goes on to define clairvoyance as the faculty of seeing with the inner eye. So that's why this triangle with the eye, the, the eye is starting to be a popular symbol now that is appearing everywhere. It represents the spiritual sight, the occult sight, the awareness of your divinity. The faculty which so remarkably was so remarkably exercised by Jacob Beam and Swedenborg. Jacob Beam is the one Isaac Newton followed and has been the mystic that has influenced so much of occultism in this modern day. But notice, she says, Jacob Beam and Swedenborg. So, Swedenborg was an occult mystic and Helen Keller embraced his teachings and she did not just embrace his teachings she lived and breathed and communicated and propagated those teachings here's a picture of helen keller when she was older look at her now uh 
Notice as she touches her chin, she's making the horned hand sign. No thumb, the horned hand sign. In 1927, New York Times says Miss Keller makes it clear that she is an ardent believer in the new church or Swedenborgianism. Helen Keller again in the book My Religion in 1927 says the 18th century out of which grew the titan genius of Emanuel Swedenborg, faith alone was exalted and not faith either, but a self-centered assumption that belief alone was necessary to salvation. So whatever you say, Helen Keller did not believe in salvation through faith alone. She did not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. His, Swedenborg's message has traveled like light side by side with the new science, the new freedom, and the new society. I am aware of encouraging voices that murmur from the spirit realm. She says, I'm also hearing those same type of voices. How could I worship three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? No one who believes in God and lives right is ever condemned. So here she's denying the Trinity, denying salvation through faith alone. She's denying hell and the everlasting lake of fire for those who do not embrace the gospel. She goes on to tell us Isaac Newton, who was like-minded with him. So she at least knows that this new science and many of these things came from the same type of mysticism that Swedenborg embraced, the devil possession of men like Jacob Beam and Swedenborg, who came later. As Newton was inspired to see the laws of attraction in the physical realm, Swedenborg perceived that love is the corresponding attractive law in the spiritual realm. So to an occultist, love is the attracted force. It is the force. It is the spirit of Satan. It's love for self. No other man highly trained in all the sciences of his time has ever asserted that he was in constant intercourse with another world for more than a quarter of a century. So she's saying this man had spirits that he was able to talk to. A divinely inspired interpreter. The literal statement of the scriptures is an adaption of divine truth to the minds of people who are very simple. So she says don't follow the Bible literally because that's foolish. I have had abundant opportunity to learn how defective the sense of the letter is in the light of modern science. So she's embraced evolution. She doesn't believe the Bible is a true statement. She says you have to read the Bible in a Swedenborgian sense. You have to read the Bible in an occult sense. There is a meaning beneath the letter that cannot be read in word but only in symbol. The inner or mystic sense, if you like, gives me a vision of the unseen. So Helen Keller was an occultist. Keller supported Dr. Hazelden. She was a personal friend of Margaret Sanger who founded Planned Parenthood and was a Nazi supporter. Helen Keller was also a nationalist socialist. Her friend Margaret Sanger taught that Australian aborigines were only one step more evolved than chimpanzees and they were just under blacks. Sanger's paper was the woman rebel, no gods, no masters. There's that satanic spirit. Helen Keller says that her favorite periodical was the National Socialist. Who was this Dr. Hazelden that Keller supported? On November the 12th, 1915 in Chicago, there was a severely deformed baby boy that was born. The head surgeon was Dr. Harry J. Hazelden. Hazelden convinced the mother not to treat the child and to let it die. This was a common practice for Hazelden. You see this today in this abortion where they are directly killing infants in the womb. You see it in hospice where somebody that they believe is not fit to live is allowed to die of thirst with no nourishment, no water and to sit there and wither away and dry up, and they call it compassion. Dr. Hazelden took the story to the press in a full-blown propaganda campaign for euthanasia, so-called mercy killing, and eugenics, which is supposedly guarding the gene pool, keeping undesirables from procreating. 
That's what abortion is about today in the eyes of these Planned Parenthood eugenics. It's Nazism in a different package. Hazelden made a movie, The Black Stork, with Hearst, about saving society from such defectives. Hazelden said that he let defectives with lies of no value die because he loved them. There it is. There's your Helen Keller love. There's the occult love. We need to kill a lot of people. It's love for Mother Earth. Charles Darrow was the attorney of the Scopes trial in the 1920s, the great evolution trial that they used as propaganda to try to make Christians appear ignorant. Well, Darrow was the attorney, the prosecute, I'm sorry, the defense attorney, and he said that society should chloroform unfit children, show them the same mercy that has shown beasts who are no longer fit to live. Helen Keller went on to write an article or a letter which was printed in the New Republic in 1915 to defend Dr. Hazelden. She says, much of the discussion aroused by Dr. Hazelden when he permitted the Bollinger baby to die centers around a belief in the sacredness of life. If many of those that object to the physician's course would take the trouble to analyze their idea of life, I think they would find that it means just to breathe. Surely they must admit that such an existence is not worthwhile. It is the possibilities of happiness, intelligence, and power that give life its sanctity. And they are absent in the case of a poor, mishappen, paralyzed, unthinking creature. So she's playing God. In the jury of the criminal court, we have an institution that is called upon to make just such decisions as Dr. Hazelden made to decide whether a man is fit to associate with his fellows, whether he is fit to live. A mental defective, on the other hand, is almost sure to be a potential criminal. The evidence before a jury of physicians, considering the case of an idiot, would be exact and scientific. Conservatives ask too much perfection of these new methods and institutions. We can only wait and hope for better results as the average of human intelligence, trustworthiness, and justice arises. Meanwhile, we must decide between a fine humanity like Dr. Hazelden's and a cowardly sentimentalism. So Helen Keller is saying, basically, when we finish with the gene pool, when we finish with our Nazi techniques, when we finish with our eugenics and our euthanasia, and our sterilization programs, when we finish making sure only the good and the fit breed, then we will end up with this perfect world. And that is Helen Keller's love. It is a Swedenborgian occult love. It is a demon-possessed, devil-possessed love. It is a love that the abortion, the, the abortionists that Planned Parenthood use today it is the love of euthanasia and eugenics. It is not a love from Jesus Christ. It is not a love that is in the Bible other than the secret, wicked, satanic love that the Bible warns us about. An article in Wikipedia says that resident students of deaf schools from the early 20th century do not recall seeing the sign anywhere until the 1970s. What they are saying is, when they went and interviewed elderly people, they said, when did you first see this horned hand, supposedly meaning, I love you, when did you first see that? They say, I don't remember seeing that till the 1970s. I have searched over and over and over, and I can find nowhere before the 1970s, in picture or in book. I'm not saying that it's not out there somewhere, but I can find nowhere where this symbol meant I love you until the 1970s, after the Beatles, after the Black Sabbath heavy metal rock and roll singers and others were using it plainly for the occult, after the Church of Satan adopted it as Satan, the symbol of love and liberty. Therefore, when people say it just means I love you, you can say, yes, it does. It means I love you in satanic language. It means I love you in the Helen Keller Nazi sense of I love you. It means I love you in the sense of I want you to uh, follow Satan and search for your own godhood. Here